Greetings, folks, and welcome to our brief little venture into Southern Hemisphere English. My purpose in this talk is just to give you a bit of a history of how the Southern Hemisphere dialect unfolded and to hold up one dialect in particular, or one dialect region in particular, Australia, as an example. Next week, if time allows, I may also get into the South Africa dialect region as there are a lot of really interesting things happening there, but we'll just have to wait and see how that unfolds. Now, just as a reminder, because I think I mentioned this before, there are three major dialect regions in the Southern Hemisphere, Australia, New Zealand, and South Africa. To recap the history of settlement, which of course is very important for the spread or development of dialects, the English settlement of Australia and New Zealand goes back to the late 18th century, with New Zealand having been discovered and claimed by Captain James Cook in 1769 and Australia the following year by the same person. From 1788 onward, Australia becomes a destination both for settlers and for transported criminals, often criminals convicted of relatively minor offenses such as trying to feed their children by stealing food. And over the course of the 19th century, there were many very aggressive land grabs done in the name first of sheep ranching, which of course is very land intensive, and from 1859 onward also in the name of gold mining. What this means is that the settlement of the country by English speakers was relatively quick, so discrete dialect zones didn't have time to develop. There are some small differences. People in, for example, northeastern Australia have a bit of a different dialect from most of the rest of the country. But broadly speaking, the dialects of Australian English are sociolects rather than regional dialects. As for New Zealand, it was settled from Australia and Britain. So settlement there began a little bit later than Australia itself and was directly influenced by both Australian English and the English coming out of Britain at the time, which was the kind of English that was also going into Australia, obviously. A common influence here, and also this influence extends to the English of South Africa, as we'll see in a moment, is the English of London in the 18th and 19th centuries. That is, particularly the Cockney dialect. And this is why you will hear many commonalities between Southern Hemisphere English and Estuary English in particular. New Zealand, on the other hand, was not a destination of convict transports, but it was settled quickly, similarly to Australia. And so here as well, the dialects tend to be not regional, but social or even socioeconomic. In South Africa, the situation is different. Though the period of settlement is roughly the same, as the British didn't seize control of the colony at Cape Town until 1806, prior to which it had been Dutch. Subsequent to 1806, though, and particularly following an influx of settlers beginning in 1829, the settlement of South Africa by English speakers was also fairly rapid over the course of the 19th century. And as you can see from this map, which we looked at before in the context of the general expansion of English in the modern period, you can see that the expansion of numerous other European languages into Africa was also very rapid at this time. The European powers were treating the African continent as basically a free-for-all. And as you can see, by 1885, which was the year of the actual partitioning of Africa, through the Treaty of Berlin, almost the entire continent by that time was under the direct control of one or another of the European powers. I will come back to this a little bit when we spend a little bit of time on South Africa in our first lecture next week. As for Australia itself, there are three dialects, broadly speaking, general, refined, and broad. The general dialect is spoken by about 80% of the population and is currently expanding at the expense of the other two. By way of example, I've included a link here to a clip of John Howard, the former Conservative Prime Minister, 
in an interview about refugees entering the country. So give that a listen and then move on to the next slide or slides where I will post examples of the other dialects as well, just so that you can have those in your mind as we start going through the characteristics of Australian English. As for the refined dialect, this one is spoken by about 10% of the population, mostly women. It tends to be considered effeminate or elitist. And as we've discussed with other dialects, this shouldn't surprise us. The tendency of, as I've said before, women to speak up and men to speak down is well attested and it's been observed in lots of different contexts. As for this particular context, the dialect seems to be a product, actually, of something called the elocution movement, which occurred in Australia in the later 19th and early and mid 20th centuries, specifically in girls refining schools. The teachers in these schools tended to be educated in received pronunciation. So the refined Australian accent is very similar to RP. It's basically what you get if you mix general Australian with received pronunciation. As for the examples I've provided, one is Kate Blanchett and the other is Malcolm Fraser, a former Liberal MP speaking against the conservative backlash towards Vietnamese refugees. So this one will link us to the conversation with John Howard in the last slide and also the reason I'm including this one is that the interviewer speaks general Australian, so you can hear during the conversation the difference between the two accents. As for broad Australian, this one also is spoken by about 10% of the population, but like the refined pronunciation, is currently on the decline. As opposed to the refined pronunciation, this one is mostly spoken by men. And it socially, it tends to socially position the speaker as masculine. It's considered down to earth, approachable, trustworthy. It tends to flag a general lack of education, but also a lack of pretense and is broadly associated with the working class. The example I provided here is actually just an Australian TV commercial for Toyota and I think you'll find it entertaining. It presents a fanciful Australian take on modern history. And of course, you may find it interesting to ponder why a Japanese car company would have its spokesperson in an Australian TV commercial be an older guy speaking broad Australian. This tells us a lot about the social register of broad Australian. As for the specific traits that make Australian sound Australian, we'll start with the vowels, specifically the front vowels, specifically the front long vowels, or rather long vowels and diphthongs. These tend to be lowered and backed. And in the case of the high front tense vowel E, it also is broken into a diphthong. So E becomes I, and thus meat becomes mate. And if we move a little further down, we come to the A diphthong, which simply drops a little lower in the mouth, becoming A. So place becomes place. And this lowering of the A diphthong to I pushes the I diphthong back further in the mouth. So I becomes I and thus the word my becomes my. So if I were Australian and wanted to tell you to meet me at my place, I would say something like, meet me at my place. And if you were listening to that and thinking that sounds very much like Cockney, it does. That's where it comes from. The vowel shift that was going on in the Cockney area at the time that Australia started being settled is simply carried to Australia and develops on its own there. So the sounds of the two accents are very similar. And if we move toward the mid and back regions, we find that these vowels also change. The mid vowel e uh, tends to be tensed and fronted to something like e. Uh. So the word nurse, which 
in a non-rhotic dialect such as received pronunciation might be pronounced nurse, would be pronounced in Australian nurse. And as for the back vowels, these of course are also in motion. The high back tense vowel u is fronted and slightly diphthongized. So u becomes something like o, which means school becomes school. A little further down, the o or o diphthong is tensed and raised a little bit to something like o. So rather than traveling in a boat, you would travel in a boat. Moving further down still, the a vowel is raised and rounded a bit to o. So brought becomes brought. And to round things out, the ow diphthong becomes ow. That is, it moves further up a bit. So the word south becomes south. And as for the short vowels, generally speaking, these are tensed and raised, especially in the broad accent. That's one of the defining features of the broad accent. Those vowels are very tense and, and quite high, sometimes extremely high. So rather than having a cat, you might have a cat, or even in broad Australian, a kit. The other vowel development in Australian that we need to talk about is something called the trap bath split, which I mentioned in the little talk on maritime English as well, with the promise that I would address it in this lecture. So, the trap bath split is a splitting of the pronunciation of the a ah vowel, realized differently in different accent or dialect regions, in which in some environments, it's raised, and in other environments, it either stays stationary or is lowered a bit. Now, in Australian English, the A ah vowel tends to be lowered before the following sounds. F, S, F, Nts, Nt, Nch, and Mpl. In all other environments, it tends to be raised. So trap becomes trap, and bath becomes bath. Your hat becomes your het, and if you are unable to do something, you don't say I can't, but rather I can't. And that's the vowels. When we move to consonants, the first thing we should probably say is that Australian and Southern Hemisphere English generally is non-rhotic in pretty much the same way that received pronunciation is non-rhotic, including the use of intervocalic linking. So, for example, whereas a Canadian would say a car, and someone using received pronunciation would say a ca, an Australian is more likely to say a ca. And while a Canadian would say a car alarm, and someone using received pronunciation might say something like car alarm, an Australian is more likely to say Caralam. There is also a slight intrusive intersyllabic R between stressed and unstressed syllables, particularly in the broad Australian accent. So with a single word, rather than saying, for example, drawing, someone speaking broad Australian might say drawing. Or with two words, rather than saying that I saw it, Someone speaking broad Australian might say, I saw it. Another little interesting detail about Australian English is that, as with estuary English or Cockney English, there is L vocalization and T glottaling in the broad accent anyways, but to a much more limited degree than we see in London. What this suggests is that these patterns, L vocalization, so for example, instead of saying Bristol, saying Bristol, and instead of saying kettle, saying kettle, or even kettle, that these patterns are of relatively recent origin, probably mid 19th century or later. That is, while many common elements of Cockney or Estuary English are carried over to Australian English, pretty much whole cloth, these two elements are not. 
or rather are not carried over as much. The suggestion there seems to be that the original English-speaking population didn't actually speak this way and that it was later immigrants, second and third generation immigrants, who brought those pronunciation traits over after the basic Australian accent was already established. And as long as we're still on the topic of consonants, Australian English in both the general and broad accents tends to engage not only in yod dropping, that is dropping the y sound in words like Tuesday or dune, and pronounce the vowel simply as a pure vowel, Tuesday, dune, but to also have the preceding consonant, either a voiced or unvoiced alveolar plosive, glide into a fricative. So rather than Tuesday or Tuesday, it would be Tuesday. And dune would not be dune or dune, but rather June. That is, it becomes a homophone for the month of June. They're pronounced the same way. Another element of Australian English shared by general and broad Australian is intervocalic alveolar flapping. That is a slight tapping of the tongue against the alveola between stressed and unstressed syllables, including the syllabic L, but not for some reason before an unstressed syllable with an N in it. So for example, while someone speaking received pronunciation, might open a bottle, an Australian is more likely to open a bottle. And while someone speaking received pronunciation might do up a button, someone speaking with an Australian accent would still pronounce the consonant, but would probably swallow the vowel, so button, as is common in many North American dialects as well, including the one I speak. And as a final element of Australian consonants, there is this odd little thing called H vocalization, which occurs in the broad accent and not too much elsewhere. And I haven't really heard this one in very many other situations either. It's not a consonant that most dialects of English have, but it's simply this. Rather than pronouncing an unvoiced laryngeal fricative, which is what we mean by the H sound, the H as in high, someone speaking in a broad Australian accent would vocalize the H if it occurs between vowels. So rather than saying behind, as a Canadian would say, or behind, as someone speaking general Australian might say, someone speaking broad Australian might say something like behind. It's not too hard to figure out where it came from. For example, you might remember in Old English, the F and V sounds, the F and V, were allophones of each other and tended to be unvocalized at the beginning and the end of a word, but vocalized in the medial position. So with the F, for example, in the word folk, F-O-L-C in Old English, it's pronounced folk, but the Old English word for hawk, H-A-F-O-C, is pronounced havoc. So the logic of H vocalization is not foreign to the history of English. It's just an oddity in terms of spoken dialects in contemporary English. So now why don't we just take a look at a sentence and do what we've done with, for example, Southern English or African American vernacular. Transcribe it into IPA and see both how it looks and how it sounds. The sentence in this case, which I've transcribed into my own dialect as nearly as I can is meet me at my place after school. We can take a boat south to Tasmania and hit a bar around midnight. So how does that work in Australian? Well, it might sound something like this. Meet me at my place after school. We can take a boat to Tasmania and hit a bar around midnight. And as sentences go, I realize it's a little on the silly side. But what I've tried to do here is include as many of the details that I've been talking with you about as I can, just so that you could have a look at them in IPA as well as give them a listen and make a direct comparison visually between Australian and Canadian English.
But of course, Australian English isn't just about the accent, it's also about the vocabulary. And one of the traits of Australian vocabulary is that they seem to have not only retained, but built on the language game of Cockney rhyming slang. This isn't really surprising, as the practice itself came from exactly that part of London culture or subculture from which many of the initial, often unwilling, immigrants to Australia were drawn. That is, very often criminals and the working poor. What they brought with them as well was a general disrespect for authority and a culture in which proper English doesn't have a whole lot of status. And down to this day, there is a sort of oppositional identity that is deeply rooted in Australian cultural consciousness. A wonderful example of that, if I can just digress for a minute, is the probably the most popular Australian folk song ever, Waltzing Matilda, which dates back to about 1895. And what I think I'm going to do is give you a handout with the lyrics and provide you with a link to a performance of the song in which the performer is kind enough to explain what some of the unique words actually mean. But to return to Australian rhyming slang, here are some of the additions that the Aussies have made to that particular verbal art form. After darks are sharks. Billy lids or just billies are kids. To take a king hit or just a king is to take a shit. And to have metric miles is to have piles or hemorrhoids. And rabbit and pork or rabbit and pork or simply rabbit is to talk. And just to give you something else to listen to other than me, here are a couple of links to spoken examples of Australian rhyming slang. So give these a listen and see how they compare, for example, to the Cockney rhyming slang that we took a look at or took a listen to a few lectures ago. Of course, there's more to Australian slang than just rhyming slang. One tendency that shows up fairly often, and this seems to have grown out of the rhyming slang habit of abbreviating the initial rhyming term, is abbreviating words themselves. So, good day becomes g'day, afternoon becomes avo, a politician is a pulley, a journalist is a journal, barbecue of course is a bobby, football is footy, and it goes on. There are also many, many wonderfully colorful terms in the Australian slang repertoire. And rather than just give you a slide and read them off to you, which I don't imagine would be terribly interesting, what I'm going to do is post a handout to our Moodle page that has about a hundred Australian slang terms. And perhaps in our tutorial on Friday, as we're already probably going to be talking about maritime slang terms, we can throw the Australian slang terms into the mix as well. But again, it's always really up to you folks what we do in the Friday tutorials. And I think that wraps up the lecture part of today's class. It's a shorter lecture than usual, I realize, but of course I've also given you a lot more to listen to in terms of sound clips than I usually do. So I'm sure I'm consuming just as much of your time as I normally would, and I don't want to take up too much more than that, because of course it's getting late in the term and I realize you're all very busy. So what I would like you to do is make sure you also listen to all of the sound clips that I've posted, and take a look over the handouts, the lyrics to Waltzing Matilda, for example, and the list of Australian slang. And when you come to tutorial on Friday, Please have any of the handouts that I've given you this week accessible. You don't have to have them printed out, of course, but have them up on your screen. Just in case our conversation turns that way, you all know what we're actually referring to. Anyways, I hope you found this interesting. I do look forward, as always, to speaking with you on Friday. Thank you very much, and bye for now.